In 1997, I was handed a piece of paper that changed my life. Printed on that piece of paper were my genetic test results. I had just tested positive for the BRCA1 gene, which means I'm genetically at high risk for both breast and ovarian cancer. Doctors expected I would get both, likely in my 40s. So imagine, 33 years old, you're healthy, and the doctor says, to stay alive, you should do prophylactic mastectomy and oophorectomy, which I was so nervous, it just sounded like, Melanie, cut off your breasts and cut out your ovaries. What would you do when faced with such a choice? For me, I just could not bring myself to do those surgeries, but instead I became extremely curious about genes, because not everyone who has the gene gets cancer. So I wondered, how can we explain that? And more importantly, can I do anything to affect it? Can we control that? So I said no to surgeries, but yes to checkups, and so I went to my doctor for checkups every six months, and life went on. <laughs> for 15 years. <laughs> Then, 15 years later, I was out riding my bike with my husband. It was a beautiful, sunny day. I felt great. And my doctor called and she said, Melanie, I have no idea what's going on, but your tumor marker is off the charts. And just like that, my life changed in an instant. So I did get cancer. I did get sick, I went through cancer and recurrences, and because I am tenacious and just wanted to live as long as I could, or at the very least keep my quality of life, have a shred of dignity for as long as possible, I did a lot of research. <laughs> I mean a lot of research. I spent six years researching, I interviewed some of the world's foremost oncologists and researchers, I developed a method to assess what I needed and tools and practices to feel as well as I could while I went through treatment. I wrote a book. And then, much to my surprise, I went into remission, <laughs> and I'm still well. And I realized that what I learned is useful not just for cancer patients, but it's actually useful for many people in many situations. For example, in relationships, in business, in healthcare. What most excited me in my research was to learn that our genes are not actually fixed, as we previously thought, but rather external factors affect what our genes are doing. This is called gene expression. You can think of gene expression just like a switch, like a light switch. These external factors come in, flip the switch, and affect what our genes are doing. Gene expression is when the gene turns on. So these external factors are things like the environment, historical events, how we're feeling emotionally, how we're getting along socially, these all turn out to affect our gene expression. And the field where this is being studied, it's a brand new field. It's less than 20 years old, so this is really cutting-edge research. The field is called social genomics. It's called that because these external social factors affect our genes, so social genomics. And especially just since 2007, the research is just exploding. Now, I just want to take a moment here to explain how it works, to be clear, because it's so amazing to me. So, you may recall that we have DNA molecules called chromosomes that contain our genes that make up the human blueprint, that is the recipe for making us. The old idea was that our genes were basically fixed. If both your parents have brown eyes, they pass on the trait to you, you're likely to have brown eyes too. The new understanding is that without changing the DNA itself, these external factors affect what our genes are doing. So think about that. That's really exciting, right? Because we can work with how we're feeling emotionally. We can work with how we're doing socially. So researchers are busy studying lots of these factors that affect all of us all the time, but there are three that I think are the most important for you, for all of us. Loneliness, stress, and lack of meaning or purpose. So first, loneliness. One of the people I interviewed is Dr. Steve Cole. He's the director of the Social 
Social Genomics Core Laboratory at UCLA. He published the first paper on human social genomics as recently as 2007. He studied women going through ovarian cancer, and he found that if a woman feels lonely, if she has perceived social isolation, if she feels lonely while she's going through ovarian cancer, she'll recur sooner and metastasize more widely, even if everyone around her says, we love you, we want you to live, we'll do everything we can to help you. If she feels lonely, her cancer will come back sooner and be more widespread, which we know is basically impossible to survive. Now, you might say, loneliness? How can loneliness affect cancer cells? That's got to be a mistake in the research, but no. The study results have been replicated three times to date. And separate from cancer, we now know that loneliness is as much a risk factor for mortality, for dying, as obesity or smoking. So think about that. If you're lonely, it's as bad for your health as if you smoke or you're obese. And so the National Health Service in Great Britain, for example, started prescribing to elderly people that they get out of the house and actually see another human being, because we now know that helps health, that improves health. It also lowers health care costs. Second, let's talk about stress. We all hear about stress all the time, right? <laughs> we evolved our fight-or-flight response, our stress response, to be able to run away from saber-toothed tigers. Well, now most of us aren't running away from predatory animals, but now maybe it's deadlines or being a parent juggling the demands of career and kids, right? Or, you know, the boss is breathing down your neck, or we get stuck in traffic, or the bridge goes up again. These things stress us out, <laughs> right? And here's the thing, though. When we get stressed out, it doesn't just affect us, the ones going through it. It also affects our kids, our children. This is the growing field of epigenetics that says that what we go through individually affects future generations. A couple of examples. Here in the Netherlands, during the winter of 1944-45, the Dutch hunger winter, the Dutch famine, when the Nazis blocked food supplies, some 20,000 people died of starvation here that winter. Dr. L.H. Lumi at Columbia University and Dr. Baus Heymans here at Leiden University studied the children of the women who were pregnant that winter. The Dutch hunger winter silenced certain genes that shows all these decades later as increased obesity and increased heart disease. And they weren't even born yet. Another example is the 9-11 babies. Dr. Rachel Yehuda studied the women who were pregnant and lived near Ground Zero on 9-11. These women gave birth to babies who were slower to sit up, slower to be able to hold their own heads up. They started reading later. They had developmental delays, and they weren't even born yet on 9-11. So evidence is growing fast around this idea that what we go through affects our children the next generation, there's some evidence that what we go through affects more than one generation, at least two. And I believe, since we're now starting to have conclusive research, let's work with that. Let's clear out the trauma of epigenetic inheritance to work with that, right? This will help us individually now, and it will help all of us in society going forward. Past generations didn't have these tools, they didn't have this knowledge, but we do. Third, the need for meaning. Now, you may know, you may know, there are two types of happiness. One kind is self-gratification, doing what you want whenever you want, no regard for anybody else, right? Like hedonism. The other type is having a sense of meaning in life. The first kind doesn't register on the human genome. The second kind? having a sense of meaning, that turns out to be very important. So whether you find your meaning from your career, your community, your kids, 
it's really important that you have that. They're not just hobbies, they're actually impacting your health. <laughs> and the way that it works is the same as with loneliness and stress. When you have a sense of meaning, your inflammation decreases, and your antiviral response, that is your ability to fight disease, increases. So inflammation down, ability to fight disease up. Okay, great. Now back to you. <laughs> Do you ever feel lonely or stressed? Or like you're having trouble connecting to a sense of meaning inside yourself? Many of us humans have this nowadays. And I believe this issue is arising in part from how we relate to our tech. You know, we have these amazing devices, right, that allows us They allow us to connect with each other all over the world, but we're not always feeling connected. We're feeling bombarded, overwhelmed, too sensitive. Maybe it's hard to focus. And maybe we have thousands of friends online, but how do we, in the flesh, connect with the people we most love? How do we stay aligned and true to what matters most to us? Here's what I mean. <laughs> right? This is my family on holiday. <laughs> Now, we're a close family. We love each other, but what are we doing? You guys are laughing, so you know it, right? We're on our devices. Is it like this in your family, with your friends, right? <laughs> in my family, we have a little joke. We call it non-tact. But it's this non-tact, not being contactful, that is giving rise to these feelings of loneliness and stress and lack of purpose that we now know are affecting our genes. So what can we do about this? Well, I believe we can do a lot of things, <laughs> but there's one skill in particular that I believe is key, and that is we can be present. This is the foundational skill we humans are losing. Maybe some of us weren't too good at it before, but the truth is you can learn how to be present simply and easily. So for example, right now I'm feeling bubbling in my stomach. <laughs> I'm feeling excited to see you. I can't quite see you because of the lights, but I'm feeling like, oh, I'm so excited. I've been thinking about this day for months and here we are. I'm feeling like, okay, my boots are really high, but I feel pretty grounded, right? I'm feeling what's happening in my body. So now I'd like to ask you, each of us, to take a moment to notice what's happening in your body right now. And if you meditate, and apparently lots of you do, this first skill is going to be familiar to you. But just notice what's occurring in your body right now. For example, do you feel tension? or tightness anywhere? Do you feel too permeable anywhere? Just notice whatever you notice, right? And as you notice what's occurring in your body right now, in the moment, that anchors presence. That feels pretty good, right? <laughs> And when we notice what's happening in our body, right, <laughs> then We can meet our needs. We can advocate for ourselves, right? <laughs> We can actually create policy based on real human needs. That's presence. So, I believe it's time, well, before we talk about that, you know, when we're doing this on our own, most of us can do it. Great, when we're quiet, but how do we do it on our feet in the midst of our busy day? How do we do it in relationships? Here's how. <laughs> how to have a conversation. <laughs> okay, <laughs> first step. Put away the phone, right? Step two, ask questions like, how are you? Step three, here's where it gets important. As you're listening to your friend's answer, notice what's happening in your body at the same time. In other words, be present. And when you can do that, something wonderful happens. They become present too. It's as simple as that. Now, I believe, you know, okay, we've got these foundational skills. There are many other skills. I believe it's time to bring all the skills of presence into our organizations. For example, work. 
After all, <laughs> you don't have to go any further than the workplace to find people who are lonely or stressed or lacking a sense of meaning, right? So imagine, picture a meeting where it's understood that just by being present, everybody brings a unique part of the solution to any project you're working on. In healthcare, imagine if nurses could implement all the tools of being present. This would return them to the place of service that called them to nursing as a profession to begin with. With cancer in particular, I would love to see a proper study of whether the skills of working with presence affect our overall survival, progression-free survival, or merely quality of life. And we should be implementing, integrating into the treatment protocol right now the skills of presence, since we know that combating loneliness actually aids survival. In the larger world, as more and more people move around the globe, whether to escape violence in hopes of better opportunities or because climate change makes migration necessary, I believe we can choose to work with presence to clear out the epigenetic effects of history. The research is clear. We all hold within us, in our genome, what our ancestors went through. So let's work with that now. This is going to keep affecting society until we address it, but we can work with it now. So I believe we're entering a new era where the skills of working with presence are being called forth in our human development to guide our companies, our communities, our cities. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.